Who is ready for our first panel? Woo! All right. <laughs> we'll keep the energy going throughout the day. Um, so for our first panel, we have four incredible women who have dedicated their lives to public, public service and each found their way into public service at unique times in their lives. Please give a warm welcome to our Woman in Politics panel. If you could all, perfect, yep, join me up front. Microphones are in the chairs, yep, they're live. No, no specific order. Perfect. Hello, good morning, ladies. I love the energy here. I love that goddesses. We'll call each other goddesses today. Uh, so my name is Dr. Monica Sanchez, and I am a councilwoman in the city of Pico Rivera. And I'm a former mayor, thank you. I am the, um, I'm a UCLA alumni, of, um, class of 2004. I got my master's from the Graduate School of Education and I got my doctorate in 2000, 2012. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so um, I had the conversation um, with Julie as well, one of my, my uh, role models who I love uh, about my experience um, in politics. You don't need a PhD from UCLA to uh, be a mayor. And so um, I had a conversation with these, these wonderful um, women. And I want, I have first um, to my right, I'll start on this end, uh, Katie Young Yaroslavsky. Did I pronounce that correctly? Thank you. Um, and our bios are also, just for time's sake, on the QR code on your table. You can scan that and read more and find us. Uh, we also have Kathy Choi here. Thank you. And we have Cynthia Flores here to my right as well. So we're gonna start and get into our uh, panel and you'll learn a little bit more about our experience and, and how we got involved in, in, in politics. So my first question is, uh, Politics is a small world. Um, the entryway is not always obvious. So I want to ask Kathy. Kathy's experience is unique. How did you get into politics and your nonprofit work? And how did you activate that passion to fight for others and stand up for uh, and represent others in your community? That's a big question. Hi, everyone. Kathy Choi. Um, I'm actually in philanthropy currently. I've been in the philanthropy sector for the past 20 years. But in my early days, um, right after UCLA, I actually were a staff member for several elected officials, including former Congressman Javier Becerra, who's now the Secretary of Department of Health, Health and Human Services. <laughs> And also, I, I worked at LAUSD for one of the as a legislative deputy, as well as a couple other government jobs before going over to nonprofit. But um, prior to that, actually, I got my start in politics. I guess if you had to um, think of it that way, as I was preparing for this panel, it was actually at UCLA that I had a start in just learning about the community and community organizing and all the different communities that were suffering, especially around 1992 civil unrest. Um, that's when I got a chance to actually volunteer in Koreatown as well as mid um, downtown to see where the gaps are. And I actually um, got an internship at City Council, LA City Council, uh, which really gave me a good sense of where where the gaps are, how I can help as a you know bike bilingual, bicultural um, immigrant, you know, um, you know, member. Um, and that's when I sort of kind of dove in and not knowing where it's going to lead. I just knew that I wanted to help the community. And of course, my parents were very disappointed because I was pre-med. <laughs> like many, you know, good <laughs> kids who came to UCLA, I just made a pivot um, and I went into um, getting an economics degree. I, I graduated with that at UCLA, thinking that I was going to maybe go into business law. Um, but ev eventually, I went into public administration in my master's. And then um, fast forward, now I'm in philanthropy and still helping with systems change and being able to now help fund some of these key program areas, which I, we thought, I thought that lacked funding and support. And Katie, can you share with us as well a little bit about your experience? Sure. Good morning, everybody. My name is Katie Yaroslavsky. I'm on the Los Angeles City Council. I started about three months ago. <laughs> Yay. Thank you. 
so I'm still adjusting to being an elected. Uh, but I grew up around politics. My mom, Laura Plotkin, was a staff person, first uh, at a state agency and then for an elected who worked in the state legislature. And so I grew up in community rooms, a lot like this one, in the corners doing homework while my mom um, presented proclamations and um, sort of ran meetings. And, and so I grew up around government. And so for me, it wasn't this faraway thing that felt intimidating. It was just my mom going to work every day. And as I got older, uh, I, I developed an interest in in climate policy work. And so I actually went to Berkeley for undergrad and UCLA for law school and knew coming out of UCLA that I wanted to do climate policy work and started off in the private sector, worked to the nonprofit sector, and then ended up working for LA County Supervisor Sheila Kuehl when she was first elected as her climate and sustainability policy deputy. And that was my first personal introduction to politics. And I loved it. Working in politics is fabulous. It's it's interesting. Every day is different. You have a chance to see a problem and then concretely tackle it. And that's incredibly empowering. And particularly during the Trump years, to be able to go to work every morning and feel like I was making some sort of a tangible difference in an area that I was passionate about was amazing. And so I did that for about six years. And um, Supervisor Kuehl met with me weekly. And she started putting in my ear, she said, you should think about running. You should think about running for something. And it was incredibly flattering, and I was completely uninterested because only crazy people run for office. <laughs> and, and that lasted for several years. And then one day, I was coming off of maternity leave, and I'd helped create this entity called the Clean Power Alliance, which is basically an a electrical utility that provides an alternative for Edison customers. And it was the first meeting of all of these city representatives that had come together to create a, a utility a power company. And I'm sitting behind Supervisor Kuehl staffing her, looking at all these people. And I'd done all the groundwork to get this thing off the ground. And I remember viscerally thinking, I want to be at that table. And so that, it was like, oh, wow, I want to be at that table. And, and that was insane to me because I don't like public speaking. I'm kind of an introvert. Uh, I'm not a natural networker. And so the next couple of years was really getting myself to a place where I, where I wanted to do it and decided to do it. And um, you know, I think the thing about being in politics is that every day is an opportunity to bring new people in. And, and um, what, the, what the speaker just talked about, you expand power. There's no, there's no zero-sum game with power. When you bring other people along and you create opportunities for people, power multiplies. And, and it's an incredible thing to see. And, you know, there's six women on the LA City Council now, more than at any other point in LA's history. And we have the first woman who's a mayor, and we have the first woman as a city attorney. And the, 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 the way we work together, even if we don't always agree, is different. And that's really cool. So thank you for sharing that. And I, too, got my bachelor's degree from UC Berkeley in psychology. And so you might think, like, I'm a psychologist. I got my master's and my doctorate in education. You might think, eh, politics is not for me. You know, um, this... You, Policy and politics is everywhere. So um, I want, uh, we have a question next for Cynthia. Cynthia and I went to UCLA at the same time, but I was in grad school, she was in undergrad, and she was the first Latina president of the, of the, um, of the UCLA, um, um, not alumni, but of the graduate, I'm um, not graduate, you were undergrad at the time, of uh, student association. So, so that's a great thing. Uh, <laughs> And it, it wasn't that long ago. Um, so we were having this conversation the other day about um, get, encouraging more women to get involved in politics and how we can do that because it seems daunting at first. And so if you can share with us, um, you shared with me a statistic that it takes about seven times before women commit to running for an office. How does someone dip their toes in the water in the political sphere if they aren't quite ready to run for office? And how do they get involved? Um, well, first of all, thank you for having us. Um, again, my name is Cynthia Flores. Um, I uh, am a board member with the California Agricultural Labor Relations Board. I serve as one of five quasi-judicial officers appointed by the governor um, and have been in that role for quite some time. Um, and uh, I, I mentioned that because um, that, that is my, my day job, but I have a, a whole host of other things that I'm involved with. Um, and I'd like to tell folks I'm politics adjacent. Um, so, and, and I say that because, to, you know, to the, to the question about how to get involved, um, I, I think sometimes we, 
may believe that there's, you know, this kind of, uh, there's only one way to be involved, whether it's, you know, getting elected, getting appointed to an office, and or, you know, serving on a commission. And those are all varied ways of being involved. Um, I think for me, um, the, the genesis or the entry point really has to do with, yes, you know, that might be an outcome of your involvement, being on a commission, being appointed, being elected. Um, but what is the foundational piece um, that I think informs involvement is figuring out what you are passionate about, right? And so what issue, what cause, um, what policy change drives you and, and, and is uh, something that fills your, your cup, so to speak, um, and finding out different points of leverage in terms of, okay, so if I want to have impact in X, Y, and Z field, um, there are different ways of going about that. And, you know, I'm a big believer of the personal is political. So us being women, women of color, um, first generation, um, you know, I, I come from an immigrant background, um, working class background, et cetera. When we enter these conversations, whatever it may be, either at, you know as a participant in a town hall, um, walking precincts for you know acquiring signatures, etc., going through those um, experiences, understanding the why, that is truly powerful. So if you're thinking about ways of uh, becoming involved, really figuring out that why, identifying uh, individuals, infrastructures that might lend themselves to make the kind of impact that you desire, and then kind of um, having a very clear understanding of what kind of impact you want to have, um, and identifying mentors that might help you along the path. But that's, that's what I would say. Thank you, that's great advice. And I think that um, it's important to also find out where are those vacancies um, for whether appointments for commissions. Um, so you're on the Agricultural Commission. Um, so find your passion as, as Katie mentioned. If it's education, environment, um, find those vacancies, get yourself on that list. And um, yes, it is work, but if you're passionate about it, it doesn't feel like work. Um, so you gotta get involved somehow, but you find those spots. Um, um, my next question also we're going to discuss, um, Cynthia and I were talking about it, um, our intersectionality and how we have different parts of ourselves. Uh, my dad was born in Mexico, in, in Michoacan, and I was born here. Um, I'm also a mother. I have two sons. And I never aspired to be a mayor or in politics. And how I got involved was um, I had two active boys and I had them in the parks year round. I would take them to swimming lessons, uh, baseball, football, everything that I could sign them up for. I was at the parks year round. And I would get angry when I saw graffiti on the slides and in the playgrounds. And so I used to call the mayor, call city hall and complain every single week. And so when one year, it was about a year that this happened, the mayor called me and said, Monica, I'd like to invite you for coffee. And so um, I had coffee with the mayor. I was ready with my list of all my complaints. And he said, do you know we have a vacancy on the Parks and Recreation Commission? <laughs> And I said, no, 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 I'm, I'm just a mom. I work full time. I don't have time, no meetings. I, this is what I need you to do. And he said, you're already doing it. Just agree to one meeting a month and just tell me what needs to be fixed. So I did that for five years. <laughs> And so I loved, I loved parks and recreation, um, youth, uh, public health and land use. That's my expertise. And that's how I got involved um, in politics. And then um, later on, our, the mayor at the time became senator, who was my senator, Bob Archuleta. And that left one vacancy for the LA City Council, of Raleigh, Pico Rivera City Council, a small city. And I'm today the only woman uh, that sits on the Pico Rivera City Council. Thank you. And I hope to have more. So that's why we're here today. Uh, but this question also is for Cynthia. Um, how does your identity affect how you show up in the world of politics? That, that is um, a very involved question. Um, and I think, you know, I identify as a Latina, um, first generation, um, working class background of Salvadoran descent. Um, and so I've um, really had to think about, um, one, how those intersectional identities um, inform my 
opinion and my positions on certain issues and recognizing that that perspective is incredibly valid and also understanding that it's oftentimes um, not a mainstream um, opinion perspective, et cetera. And, you know, un identifying, okay, as it is being a leader or being a leader in politics is tremendously um, difficult. You're under a microscope scope at all times. Um, and then having to also acknowledge that oftentimes when you are a woman, woman of color, Latina, et cetera, it more likely than not is gonna be the case that you're one of few, if not the only one in these spaces. Um, and that creates an additional stressor, right? Because not only are you in those spaces representing yourself, your perspective, which oftentimes because of just the way that, <laughs> that the mainstream society works is often invalidated, right? Um, you're also in those rooms now as a quote unquote representative, right? And so what ends up happening is that you are not only just representing yourself, your background, your history, et cetera. Now people are pointing to you to represent, okay, well, what do X group think about X, Y, and Z, right? And then not only is that a pressure that you have to kind of understand like, okay, well now people are turning to me to be the representative of X group. You have to, as a leader and someone that's self-aware, understand that you know X group is a multifaceted intersectional group and understand the limitations that you yourself might inhabit in your leadership because you don't have the li lived experiences of everyone in your group. And so for me, being someone that has been in space for, for quite some time, as Monica mentioned, or Dr. Sanchez mentioned, you know, I was a um, student body president at UCLA. I served on the Board of Regents when I was a UC um, I law student, have served on a number of boards, nonprofit, political action committees, et cetera. Um, at, through my journey, I've come to realize that it is important to, to take a, a seat at that table, but also to challenge ourselves as, as representatives or, you know, the so-called representatives and leaders in those positions to constantly um, better our understanding and our capacity to be able to serve the whole um, while at the same time recognizing um, that there is a, a, a great need to speak on, on issues from your lens and perspective. Thank you, thank you, that's great. And one thing I wanted to share as well in being often the only one, the only woman in that space is sometimes it is a challenge in you, we receive um, microaggressions, you know. Um, for instance, even when I was running for city council, I was the only woman running, the advertisement flyer, they had a um, candidate forum uh, in the community where residents could come and listen to us debate and ask question, answer questions. And the flyer had a picture of a man in a gray suit advertising the candidate forum. So the, the idea that only men uh, can run on city council, although my city is primarily Latino, just things like, just things like that, you, you get microaggressions and it's okay to push back. And I love our speaker earlier, Christine, um, don't, you know, it's unapologetic. Be yourself. Um, I love to wear red and pink and my hoop earrings. Um, <laughs> and I have long hair. So do what you feel comfortable and take up um, your, your space and be present. And it is possible. So be all parts of yourself and, and be unapologetic in that. And I love that. Um, so I do have another question for, um, so politics is a changing environment with changing environment with pressure coming in from a lot of directions. How do you build an institution that uplifts women in politics? Um, let's start with Katie. There's a lot of pressure. And I think that the best way to transform policy is to start with your own team and make sure you're creating space for a diversity of perspectives and experiences. So um, I have a lot of working moms on my team. I think that it's important to put my money where my mouth is. I have three little kids and the oldest is eight, the youngest is two. And just it changes the way we run our office and the flexibility that we afford to staff to work from home or to come in late or bring their kid in. So I think that we start to change what a place and what an institution looks like 
when we create flexibility for different lived experiences and needs. And you know, I think I think that's the most important way, frankly. And I'll I'll just stop. It's okay. Can you answer that too, Kathy? You have a I think being also politics adjacent and being in the community and helping to build um, more alliances for women um, who are not traditional leaders, I think um, we do need to show up for one another and be able to continue to challenge and also point out that no, you do have that ability to run. I think me, out of all people, I'm such a reluctant leader. I'm always like, okay, fine, I'll do it, you know, but if nobody else wants to do it, you know, I think all of us, I think it's, it could be also cultural and also just something like, I think a lot of us who are also very perfectionists, right, unless we could bring our, our whole self, we don't, we're not ready yet, you know, we need how many times to convince ourselves, but I think sometimes it does help for your allies and your, I always say my, my personal board of, you know, advisors, my friends um, who are sisters and also some brothers as well who are willing to put my name in, vouch for me, and just say, no, you have it in you. And be able to, and also be able to um, come up with a way to uh, fundraise. I think all of us, especially women, like oftentimes we're so afraid to fundraise. I think we get really scared, but I think it's part of relationship building because without that, you cannot have the platform to actually win some of these offices. So I think we need more strategy. We need better alliance. Um, and also a chance for you to also figure out what your role is, what is your passion, because if you're not passionate about a, a topic that you could like, you know, continue to advocate for, for a long time, you're gonna burn out soon, um, because it's, it's gonna be a very uphill road, and it, it also gets very ugly, um, and are you, are you willing to have that tough skin? So I think sometimes you, can't, you do need that intentional training, um, and also be okay to, you know, I think public speaking is also a skill set that you could also practice. But I'm also wondering like how some people are like, shying away because they think, oh, I'm an introvert, I can't. No, there's actually more, um, I I've noticed there's stronger leaders who are introverts because they're more um, in tune with what they're thinking and they need to process. They don't just speak. And I think that makes it more of an authentic leader. Um, so I think those, those are some of the things that I observed in terms of like what, what a successful political campaign or, you know, a candidate can be. Thank you. And, and you use the term political adjacent, but I believe it's all <laughs> politics. Know. You know, whether you're on a commission, whether you are a staff member for a politician, we are all connected. And I think, um, just, I want to encourage any anyone out here. You don't have to be a poli sci major. Any anybody could do it. Whether you're in construction, you're uh, an entrepreneur, your own business owner. In my city, for instance, uh, the biggest supporters um, were women business owners in my city, and they contributed to my campaign. And and some people are introverts and they don't want to talk to people in public, but maybe they have this large email list or they're awesome on social media. Just think of what the skill set that you have and how you can apply that. And if you're embarrassed to public speak, I still get nervous all the time. Um, there's consultants for that. They help you. <laughs> they can coach you. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, there's a lot of coaching. That's another job. I, I think there's women that have that job out here um, that can coach you and make you um, an awesome candidate. And you already are, you already have a skill set that you can apply there. So that's it for my set questions. But I, I think we have time to open it up to uh, questions from the audience for any of us. Absolutely. Same deal. Please raise your hand. And I will quickly walk over to you. And then can you um, say who you're directing your question to, if it's specific? Oh, I'm just directing it to where it says women in politics. <laughs> Perfect. <laughs> I think it should say incredible women in yeah. politics. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. That's it. Oh, <laughs> that's wonderful. <laughs> Hi, it's me again. <laughs> and I know you guys are all incredible, but Ladies, friends, <laughs> fellow Bruins. No, Sister Bruins. Sister Bruins. Goddesses. I love goddesses. She's always telling me what to do. <laughs> anyway, my question is, are there any movements really to push for there to be larger numbers of representatives on council, city councils so that it opens up space for more women to participate and makes it possible for city council people to do more jobs? I noticed that people, when your city council people show up, we get 15 minutes because they got to be somewhere else because they're representing such large districts. 
So is there any kind of movement taking place to really consider expanding the number of city council seats? Is that for me? <laughs> well, I'm looking at you I don't know what's I live in CD15, but I think it would apply to all the municipalities yeah. mm -hmm. in general, because we're a bigger country now. Right. So. Right. Sure. So yes, at the city of Los Angeles, there, um, there's a newly created ad hoc governance and reform committee, and that's one of the things that's been committed, uh, considered is expanding the council from 15 right now. So there's 15 council members that represent approximately four and a half million people. So it comes out to be about 260,000 people per district. And, um, and what's interesting about that too is that in terms of volume of constituent calls, we actually get more calls per day. We get several hundred calls and emails a day than Supervisor Kuehl did, and she had two million constituents. And part of the reason for that is that, is that we're the closest level of government to the ground. And so if there's a pothole, we get a call. If there's a homeless encampment, we get a call. If you want your trees trimmed, we get a call. If the lights go out, I get 500 calls to my personal cell, <laughs> which is what I did last weekend. And so uh, personally, I'm a little bit conflicted on in increasing the size of the council because I think that voters would have to approve it and it would have to be part of charter reform. So it would go on the ballot. And the, the challenge is that I don't think people want to increase the budget for the council, but they want to increase the number of council members. So if you give me half as many staff because you double the size of the council, I'm still short, I'm, I'm gonna be short staffed with half as many constituents. And so I think most, so much of what the council does is, I have two teams. I have a, a, a district office that does constituent work and I have a policy team that does city hall policy, proactive policy making. One is very reactive and one is much more proactive, right? And they work with each other, it's iterative, but they do two different things. And um, a lot of the work that we're doing right now is on the policy side because the city is so profoundly broken. So I've got 12, 13 people, more than half my team doing constituent work, but much of my time is thinking about how do we change our homeless response system, right? How do we reimagine public safety? What does that look like on Metro? What does that look like um, in our jails? What does that look like in terms of youth development programs? And so if you d doubled the number, Maybe we, that would be cool because we'd have more people to work with, but I don't know that it uh, makes for better constituent services if we're not increasing the budget significantly. So that's, that's a great. Hot debate. Perfect. Thank you. All right. I'm back here now, and my dear friend Sonia is going to ask a question. Thanks, Haley. Thank you all, first of all, for serving, doing what you're doing, and taking the plunge. My question is more foundational and applies to all of you. We can always give money to a campaign. That's the fuel for the political machines. But in terms of actual hands-on, you find a candidate you like, you like what they're doing. What can we do now? We're not the young, chippy people with the energy of the undergrad, okay? Um, so at our phases in life, what help would all of you be needing behind the scenes? What can we do? I can answer that. Um, the phone banking, um, calling out, calling voters to to vote for the candidate. Um, oftentimes, you can do it remotely now. So if you have your own cell phone, um, you can they'll set up a Zoom number for you. So sign up to do phone banking, um, as well as um, if you prefer to walk, uh, <laughs> canvassing, uh, walking door to door, and and going out and talking to people. If if you prefer um, and are able to to get that get your steps in in that way, those are two ways that I can think of. Katie, anything else? I'll just say that everyone in this room has their own networks and their own uh, strengths and uh, expertise. And so I think each person who wants to get involved, and I just went through a two, two and a half year campaign, so I've, this is still top of mind even though I'd much rather forget it. Uh, so there's a lot, there are a lot of ways. You think about like the three or four people who you know who you could introduce a candidate to or a newly elected to. Uh, think about things that you see wrong with the world that you have deep expertise in and, and send, send the elected or the candidate some information or offer to help them think through a hard policy uh, area that you have expertise in. So I think, I think Phone banking, things like that. I mean, I had I had a whole range of people knocking on doors with me. All of you can knock. I mean, presumably many of you can knock on doors. So there's a lot of ways to get involved with the campaign, but they're also actively. But and there's also behind the scenes connecting and and sharing your networks with a candidate is a really helpful way to help them win. 
and there's different roles too. So for instance, one challenge that I had is they said, um, Monica, you need to have more presence on your social media. Well, I can't be at the event, take photos of myself and then go and upload them on Facebook. Um, so you, if you're really good at social media or you're a photographer, um, contact that candidate and say, you know what, I have this skill, I'd like to help you. Um, I had to fundraise during the pandemic and there were no restaurants, no bars open. Um, it was very difficult. So I had a friend that he's an artist and he said, you know, I'm not into politics, but uh, he donated his time to do a Zoom paint night. Um, and we had, we registered people to, they pay a little fee, we give them a Zoom link. And um, I had a, a Zoom virtual paint night fundraiser. And so he donated his skill skill set to me. Um, he, he's an introvert as well and didn't want to knock or, or call people. But think about what skill set you have and send the, send the candidate a message, whether on Facebook or call their campaign and say, you know, I really like what she's doing and what can I do to help? I, I'm, I do X, Y, and Z and, and this is what I can do to help you. I think, oh, yeah. can I make a comment? Um, so for someone who's, I can't actively campaign anymore or give um, because I work for a private foundation, but there are ways that you could also get involved in terms of, you know, in between election seasons, you could always volunteer and help out with different causes and, you know, and you could also host different coffee chats. I think a lot of elected officials prefer smaller gatherings now to kind of, and they, they do town halls, show up to some of those and help to host some of those as well as make it as long as you make it you know neutral nonpartisan I think we could all make sure that all the key issues are being you know addressed especially during the pandemic years I've seen an increase in volunteerism in all walks of life which was really great to see because our foundation we also fund many programs nonprofit that rely on volunteers and they were the ones who actually raised some of the issues some of the gaps in the system that was not working and oftentimes many of you may also get invited to some of these private public type of partnership meetings where you can address some of these issues. So I think sometimes for me, it's more important to keep the elected officials accountable in between those election season and making sure that all their promises do get met. Even if, you know, it's, it's challenging, at least they're thinking about it. Um, so that, that'll be my suggestion. That's great. I, another one that I thought of really quickly is um, you can do... Um, small scale meet and greets for a candidate if you have your own home. Um, so even if you don't have a lot of money or your friends don't have a lot of money, um, I'm thinking like the dinner with 12 strangers, but they're not strangers. Invite your 12 best friends and say, hey, I'm supporting this candidate. Can you pitch in 20 bucks? If I invite five friends to pitch in 20 bucks and that's $100. So you don't have to have a lot of money, but that's an opportunity also for that candidate to meet other people. And uh, just every, every $5, $20, dollars helps when you're campaigning. You need paper for the copy machine and every little thing, uh, every little penny counts. Perfect. Thank you. Question up front. Yes. Um, good afternoon. Thank you so much, honorables. Uh, I have a question for Katie. Uh, I'm a former cultural affairs commissioner appointed by Sev Yaroslavsky. And I have a question. Have all of your appointments been met? Have you fat? So I get very few appointments. Oh. They're like three. Oh, okay. <laughs> uh, and, and they're filled. And they're most of the appointments, the vast majority of appointments at the city are the mayor's to me. Yes. And she is very much actively in the process of filling all of those. So I'm sitting next to you, so we should talk. <laughs> yes, but my a question is for all the incredible goddesses here. How do they get appointments? Because I remember that was one of the questions. How did you get the appointment? It was another sister that recommended me to that. So that's how I got Sev, and then the mayor appointed me. So a lot of times people don't know the process. If you, if you don't mind sharing that, I think it's important. Yeah, so the process of getting appointed to something, as far as I can tell at the city, is all over the place. Uh, it's who you know. It's blindly reaching out. It's making sure people know that you're interested. You can go to the city's website and see there's the, the mayor, Mayor Bass literally has hundreds of appointments, everything from airport commissioner to Metro board and everything in between. So go online, see what you're interested in, see what matches up with your skill set. 
And then you can reach out to your council member if you live in the city of LA. I think you have to live in the city of LA to be uh, appointed to one of these commissions. Reach out to your council member, express an interest, and they may be able to help if you know someone in the mayor's office, reach out to them. Um, that's probably the best way is to reach out to your council member. And you know, the, the mayor's got a whole team of people making, at the city of LA at least, making, helping to make appointments. There's, a, I think, a committee, uh, and maybe committees for some, alone, standalone committees for some of the bigger appointments. And so it's, it's, a, it's a little bit of an insider baseball thing, but you, if your council member is willing to engage, they can help sort of navigate that for you. Just a quick comment and a plug for UCLA Alumni Association's um, online programming. Um, our fellow alumni um, board member, Dean Flores, you recently had a webinar that talked about this particular issue. How do you get appointed? It's not just a city. There's county. There's a state. There's so many commissions out there. They're looking for people to apply. So he actually went through several different um, steps. So it's available online. So Julie and Sandy probably could send you the link. But I thought that was a very informative session. That's great. That's a great plug. Um, my city is a smaller city, and it is true. Each council member gets to appoint one person. They must be a resident that lives in the city. So definitely go to their events. So like if you see them campaigning and they're going to have a fundraiser, or if it's the uh, pra city's prayer breakfast or state of the city, go to those events and get some get some face time. Also get recommendations. So, you know, Katie, um, you know, you can say, I'm, I'm UCLA. Remember, we met at this event. Try to get other council members or uh, other commissioners to recommend you or have a reference. So that way um, they will, you'll just get that face time. But um, traditionally, helping them with their campaign, um, having the, the council member or the mayor see you that you're active in the community um, is really helpful as well. So that's that's how I got on the Parks and Recreation Commission was I was always out at the parks and I was very vocal about the parks. And so the mayor um, appointed me to that commission at that time. But there is an application process. I'm sure a lot of people apply. Um, every, each city might be different. It's a little harder in the city of LA, but um, you know you have to be your own advocate, get that FaceTime and, and um, put your name out there and, and go to those events and, and talk to the people that, that make those appointments. Perfect. Well, thank you. That's all the time we have for our Women's and Politics panels. So if we could please give a round of applause for all of the wonderful women here today with us. So thank you. Thank you.